Welcome everyone to the Roaring Twenties and the Outrageous Life of Eugene Valentine Brewster and Corliss Palmer. Corliss Palmer was first noticed in 1920 when she won a beauty contest sponsored by one of Brewster's movie magazines. Overnight she became the most beautiful girl in America. This article appeared in Macon Telegraph, Macon, Georgia and all over the country in December 1920. Corliss was from Macon. She won first place in Fame and Fortune contest in which 50,000 pretty girls competed. Her measurements and description have been procured by Eugene V. Brewster, president and editor of the Motion Picture Classic, the Motion Picture Magazine, and Shadowland Magazine. They include everything from the size of her ears to her weight in a one-pound bathing suit. If you wear the same number shoe as she does, the same size gloves, have the same color eyes, and the same length of nose, plus many other measurements, then you are just about as ideal as a woman can get. Of course, nowadays, this is silly. But back then, to Eugene Brewster, and I guess his movie magazine fans, it was of the utmost importance. This is a list of Miss Palmer's measurements. They even measure her eyelashes and the distance from the center of her eyes to the bottom of her nose, which is two inches. I will not bore you with the description of Corliss, but the funniest statements were, her lips are neither full nor thin, her eyes are large and lustrous, the long lashes drooping gracefully over them. The white of the eye shows slightly under the ball giving at times a dreamy, languid expression. The article goes on and on, gushing about Corliss. Plans were to feature Corliss in a five-reel feature photodrama being prepared by the Brewster Production Company. In a letter Corliss wrote to her mother, she stated that when she finishes the picture, she will be worth around $3,000. Before Corliss went to New York, she was a cashier at a cigar stand, making around $15 a week. The key name here is Eugene V. Brewster. He was a millionaire publisher, married to his second wife, and had a child with her. In 1916, Eugene married the present Mrs. Brewster, Eleanor, and he brought her to the metropolis to live. Not being more than well-to-do, he selected a comparatively modest establishment this consisted of a six-room apartment in West 84th, off Central Park. They had one servant. They lived simply. For incidentals, Mrs. Brewster received weekly, she says, $75. As Brewster's business expanded, his income permitted a more imposing residence. Accordingly, he bought the charming, unpretentious place on Long Island. He also kept a small apartment in Brooklyn for overnight if he was kept late at work and where in the daytime he interviewed models anxious to pose for his colored plates. The apartment was very convenient. Corliss was 19 or 20 at the time and he was almost 50 when she won the contest. So the daughter from his first marriage is an adult. And from the pictures, you can tell that wife number one is much older than wife number two, and Corliss is much younger than them all. So, in 1920, Corliss arrived on the scene. Brewster acknowledged his enthusiasm for her good looks, but laid it to purely artistic appreciation. Before Mrs. Brewster and the world knew what happened, Corliss was calmly installed as a member of the household. For a time, all was apparent harmony, but not for long. Irritated by the presence of her husband's protege, Mrs. Brewster protested, and the result was that the publisher bought Agapemone and moved there with Corliss and her mother and her sister. Articles claim that Brewster tried in vain to get a divorce, but Mrs. Brewster claimed he only wanted to separate, and in 1922, Mrs. Brewster received a generous settlement. To make Corliss's home lavish, 
Brewster personally supervised the reconstruction of the handsome house to the tune of $25,000. The house originally cost $50,000. Italian gardens were sunk into the yard. Shrubs were profusely planted and the landscape altered. In the meantime, Mrs. Palmer, Corliss's mother, acted as a chaperone to the middle-aged publisher and her daughter. They all occupied separate apartments. Brewster insisted, he said, on not violating any of the proprieties. In 1922, Mrs. Brewster, number two, who was the current wife, filed for separation. She claimed that the birth of their son caused Eugene to change his attitude of romantic affection for her. She named Corliss Palmer as the cause of the separation. During all this publicity, Mrs. Brewster, number one, had something to say. She was still drawing alimony from the publisher, and she was quoted by Brewster himself that she is supporting him in his latest wifely debacle. Also, the first wife has four children. One son-in-law works for Brewster Publications at a generous salary. You would think she, wife number one, would have hard feelings against wife number two. And she did. Brewster said, I'm going to marry Corla someday. I'd live on a desert island in the South Seas with her alone, he added. Corla thought that love was enough for her in 1922. So Mrs. Brewster had actively been speaking to her attorneys and she wanted a separation on grounds of cruel and barbarous treatment. That Brewster once spent $18,000 a year in maintaining Rosalind, their home, but that he had cut that amount to 6000 That he demanded that she pay all the Rosalind bills, including coal, out of her allowance and dismissed the baby's nurse. That he once told her that unless she permitted him to entertain Corliss in their home, he would compel her to live in a very different and much less expensive style than she was accustomed to. The separation proceedings began in 1921 and were finalized in 1924 with a separation, not a divorce. Brewster said, I have had but three real loves in my whole life. Corliss is the last and greatest of these three. I desire no other love, but I shall always pursue the search for beauty. Which explains why he was conducting another test to find the most beautiful woman in America, which Corliss was supposed to be until the new contest started. In the article, they continue to compliment and gush over each other. Love is the greatest thing in the world, interjected Brewster. I am a one woman's man. He already has two wives. I cannot live without beautiful Corliss. It takes two souls to make life worthwhile. When his first wife heard of the supposedly romantic comments Corliss and Brewster made about each other, she made fun of them. She said Brewster used to say the same things about her. Mrs. Brewster is Roman Catholic, so she is content with separation and plenty of alimony. What angered her is when her husband brought Corliss to live in the same house with her. She could not stand that, she said. So finally, she threw Corliss's things out and locked the door against her husband one rainy night. At one point, Brewster wrote a letter to his wife. He told her that he and Corliss agreed to separate for two weeks to see just what they thought about each other. Corliss went hundreds of miles away to see old friends. Brewster said, All the time she was making preparations to go, it seemed as if I could not bear it, but I managed to endure it, constantly thinking of the old proverb, out of sight, out of mind. He wrote, I could not eat or sleep, and when she returned, I felt that I could never let her leave me again, whatever the cost. In 1923, Brewster conducted another beauty contest in which 16-year-old Miss DeHart won. She had lovely blue eyes and golden brown hair. Besides being beautiful, she was an accomplished dancer. Miss DeHart, in winning the beauty contest, will be given the promised 
trip to New York City and be royally entertained. She will also have a sculptor model her head and have her portrait painted by a well-known artist. Of course, Corliss was very much afraid that Brewster would be the one who will wine, dine, and escort Mr. Hart to theater parties and dances, just like he did Corliss. Now, just as it had been for Brewster's wife, Corliss had to worry about the other women in his life. Word came to Mrs. Brewster number 2 that her husband was plotting a divorce in the state of Sonora, Mexico. She swore that he would never be able to marry Corliss, but Brewster went through with the Mexican divorce and immediately married Corliss. In 1926, his second wife, the one we were just talking about, filed an alienation suit for $200,000 and another $200,000 lawsuit against one of Brewster's magazines. But by December of that year, it was settled and the divorce was granted. Soon, Eugene sold Brewster Publications, Inc. to several other officers of the company. The price was not disclosed, but one close to those who swung the deal admitted that the property had been transferred to protect the new Mrs. Brewster's financial rights. After that came the first intimation of the crash of Brewster's fortune. The million-dollar love nest in Morristown was offered for sale, and the lovebirds moved to Los Angeles, California, and Brewster presented Corliss with a lovely new home. In March 1931, Corliss and Brewster were remarried to make their Mexican marriage legal, and they seemed quite happy and contented, even though much of Eugene's money had disappeared via the legal route. The couple struggled trying to boost Corliss's career in Hollywood. He also attempted to start his own film company, which was not much of a success. A year or so later, they disposed of the luxurious large home they had taken in Los Angeles and auctioned off the art objects, antiques, paintings, and rare editions that Brewster had been accumulating for 25 years. They moved into a humble three-room cottage. Then the announcement of the separation came. Shortly afterwards, the cottage was foreclosed, but Brewster didn't lose hope. Corliss and Brewster separated in October of 1931, just months after their marriage. Since October 1931, Corliss was allegedly having an affair with Albert J. Cohen, and his wife sued for divorce, claiming Corliss as a correspondent and she sued Corliss for $100,000 for alienation of affection. In that deal, Corliss was called the love thief. At the age close to 60, Brewster was looking forward to a brilliant career opening before him. He planned on divorcing Corliss and marrying 25-year-old Dorothy McCormick and start anew. I guess Corliss got too old for him. In 1932, she was just about 32 years old. In February of 1933, articles popped up about poor Corliss. Apparently, she was going by the name of Edith Mason of Pasadena, trying to rejuvenate her acting career. In an article from February 1st, she had registered at the Palace Hotel as Edith Mason. She was removed from her room by police who said they were called after a physician advised that she be taken to a hospital. Hysterical and struggling, the young woman was taken from her hotel only after police had placed her wrists in leather handcuffs. At the hospital, a doctor said she became violent, struck a nurse, and attempted to strike him. In her effects, police found letters addressed to Corliss Palmer two driver's licenses bearing the name Corliss Palmer, and two Hollywood addresses. During her stay in the hospital, she kept repeating the name Al. Of course, Al is Albert J. Cohen, whom Corliss was having an affair and whose wife was suing her for alienation of her husband's affections. When Cohen was asked, he stated that if there had been any romance, it was all off now. This article states that Corliss has never divorced Brewster, 
although they were legally separated since October 1931, terminating five years of marriage, postdating the collapse of the Brewster's millions. When rest, hospital care, and food made Corliss coherent, she whimpered. I chased the rainbow, and now look at me. Her forehead was wrinkled in bewilderment, and her eyes were half closed with weariness. The girl who a few years before had been the envy of a million hopeful Cinderella's said that at 28 she was already fed up with life. She was broken-hearted because her lover, Al, had sent her to San Francisco to cool off, but she didn't cool off. Just before she left Hollywood, Corliss heard that Al was giving a party, and she was not invited. She had gone everywhere with him in the past, she said. She said, they could not keep me out of the party, but Al kept introducing Corliss to the woman he was with, as if she was just a friend. She was astonished and hurt, so she went outside to cool off. She went back in, and it happened again. She said their tempers flashed, and then they had a huge fight. She had hit the other woman. Hollywood gossips say that Corliss won the fight but lost the man. After the quarrel, they still had bitter feelings. He asked her to go to San Francisco to cool off, and all she felt was that she had been deserted. The doctor asked Corliss if she wanted to go to Hollywood or be sent home to her mother, and she refused both. She said she got a letter from Al, the man she loves, that his love had died and all she wanted to do was drink herself to death. That's why she ended up in the hospital. As they were talking, Corliss received a message from Brewster. He wrote, If Corliss needs me, I will come to her and do anything I can. She was surprised the man she loved had not answered her cry for help, but the middle-aged husband who reluctantly had told the world of their coming divorce eagerly volunteered to come to her aid. She said that Brewster was always kind, always true and gentle. But she gave him up for another love. She gave up everything, and there was nothing left. She became very morose and said that she wanted to die, and she had nothing to live for. She said, Too many promises made to me have been broken. Corliss was in a sorry sight. Her face was marked by what the San Francisco police declared had been a five-day drinking bout. Her eyes were like red wells, her hair a mess, and her beauty seemed dim. She was in a cell-like room next to the compartment set aside for maniacs. After Corliss was sufficiently recovered, she was moved out to the city and county hospital observation ward, where she was released at her own request after a week. In 1935, Corliss was sued by Citizens National Bank and Trust Savings Bank for $160, alleging she owed it since 1931. The loan was a debt of her former husband, Brewster. In February 1939, Eugene V. Brewster died. He had accumulated $3 million, but lost it all. Most people blamed Corliss, but I believe he lost his own money. He had also accumulated four wives. Last we knew, he wanted to marry Dorothy McCormick. They were madly and passionately in love. But I guess she couldn't wait the two years it took to divorce Corliss. His fourth wife was Lyanne Hill Brewster, not McCormick. Only two members of his family attended his funeral service in Brooklyn. They were his fourth wife, Mrs. Lyanne Hill Brewster, and a daughter by his first wife. His brother, Carlton E. Brewster, wealthy Long Island real estate man, decided not to attend because he was down in Florida and had a bad cold. That was an unfortunate decision because it caused Carlton to travel to his own funeral instead. The day after Eugene was buried, Carlton was killed in an automobile accident. Eugene Brewster has frequently been incorrectly identified with the hero in George Barr McCutcheon's famous Brewster's Millions, but his career could not have been 
the inspiration for that popular novel since it was written in 1903, some years before R. Brewster made his fortune. In later life, Brewster did write a book called Brewster's Millions, How He Made Them, How He Lost Them, and How They Could Have Been Saved. His obituary said, The saga of Eugene Brewster was that of a man who made and lost millions with some grace, who married four times, who wrote books and painted pictures, who manufactured perfume and tooth powder, who practiced law and published the first movie magazines, who created film stars and hobnobbed with the late Mayor Gaynor, who was a playboy and a politician of sorts, who did almost everything under the sun and did it unbelievably well, and who never lost his spirit and his charm. Eugene Brewster's death at 69 removed from the contemporary scene one of the most amusing, dashing, adventuresome, brilliant, and delightful persons who ever helped to put Brooklyn on the map. Now Corliss, on the other hand. Most of the articles I've read painted Corliss as fairly spoiled and demanding, but the articles were loaded with her pictures. The tantalizing gossip about her and Brewster gave him much more fame than he would have had if he hadn't met Corliss. They even blame her for Brewster's losing his millions. Let's face it, he was an old man after young women and obviously made the wrong decisions when it came to his money. We can also attribute the loss of his millions to the Great Depression, which lasted from 1929 to 1939. Nothing more substantial was written about Corliss unless it was about her involvement with Brewster. Many people say she was in and out of hospitals the rest of her life, but I can't find any evidence of that. She was 28 when she had her breakdown. Poor Corliss died at age 53 in 1952. She died without a long glowing obituary. Possibly she remarried and lived a quiet life under her husband's name. I hope she did. If anyone has found real proof of the cause of her death as possibly a death certificate, make a comment below. I hope you enjoyed getting to know Corliss Palmer and Eugene Brewster. Subscribe for more stories. Thanks for listening. Bye.